number 15. So this is chapter 14, The Marketplace of Secret of Nim. When you're done watching these videos, go to the Google form and fill them out. It's called chapter 14, The Marketplace. Mrs. Frisbee's head was buried in her arms. I never knew, she said. All I knew was that he didn't come back, but I never knew what happened. I didn't even know he knew you. Why didn't he ever tell me? Justin touched her shoulder gently. It's hard for you to learn in this way, no, so suddenly, he said. We thought about telling you when it happened, but we decided we shouldn't. It wouldn't have done any good. You ask why Jonathan never told you about us, Nicodemus added. He had a good reason. A good one. He had a reason. A good one. Still, he worried about it a lot, and he might have told you in the end, but by then it was too late. What was the reason Mrs. Frisbee raised her face? There were tears on her cheeks, but she had, but she had stopped crying. To answer that, I would have to tell you quite a long story. The whole story about us, and Nim, and Jonathan, and how we came here. He came with us, you see. I don't mind doing that, but I don't know if there is time now. I think there is, said Justin, if Mr. Ages and I get to the powder while well, you are telling it. With this leg, said Mr. Ages glumly, that will take long enough to tell it twice. I had forgotten, said Justin contritely. Would it be better if I went alone? No, said Mr. Ages. There are so many different powders in my storeroom. You wouldn't know which to bring back. I'll go with you, but we'll go slowly. No, said, uh, and I, said Arthur, we'll, we'll see about the equipment for tonight. We'll need shovels, crowbars, blocks and tackles, rollers. He left, still listening to, listen, listing tools. Nicodemus said to Mrs. Frisbee, I think that we too should leave the library. There will be others coming in like Isabella to practice reading and some to do research. Research? We've got some new books on agriculture. Farming, gardening, fertilizing, things like that. And we're studying them. It's all part of the plan. I don't know what the plan is. No, agreed Nicodemus, but when I've told you our story, perhaps you'll understand that too. He opened the door and led Mrs. Frisbee down the corridor past several more doors and all closed. He stopped before one, which he opened. My office, he said, please come in. The room she entered was smaller than the library, but much more comfortable, almost elegantly furnished. There was a rug on the floor, the same pattern she noticed as the carpet in the hallway above. A light recessed in the ceiling and another in the wall next to the table. There were bookshelves. On one shelf, an electric clock hummed quietly to itself. A book lay open on the table with a chair in front of it. Against the opposite wall stood a small sofa, neatly upholstered in cloth. But what attracted Mrs. Frisbee's attention most was a box in one corner of the room, a box with dials and a small light shining from the front. From this box came a soft sound of music. She listened entranced. You like music, said Nicodemus? So do I. That must be a radio. Again, something vaguely remembered from what Jonathan had once told her. Music. She had heard it only two or three times in her life when the Fitzgibbons had left a window open and someone was playing inside, but never up close. It was a lovely sound. Yes, said Nicodemus, we didn't get it for music, of course, but to hear the news. Still, as long as it's here, why not use it? He sat down, and so did Mrs. Frisbee. Now, he said, tell you, I'll tell, I will tell you about Nim. You'd be interested, I think, because your husband was part of it. And when I finished, I think you should see why he felt he could not tell you himself. The story begins, Nicodemus continued, not at Nim, but at a marketplace on the edge of the big city. It was called the Farmer's Market, a great square of a place with a roof over part of it and no walls to speak of. There early every morning, the farmers arrived all over from, from all over the surrounding countryside with trucks full of tomatoes, corn, cabbage, potatoes, eggs, chicken, ham, and food for the city. Uh, one part of it was reserved for the fishermen who brought crabs and oysters and bass and flounder. It was a fine place, noisy and full of smells. We lived near this market, my father, my mother, my nine sisters and brothers and I, underground in a big pipe that had once been part of a storm sewer, but was no longer used. There were hundreds of other rats in the neighborhood. It was a rough life, but not so hard as you might think, because of the market. Early evening at five o'clock, the farmers and the fishermen would close up their stalls, pack their trucks and go home. At night, hours later, the cleanup men would arrive with brooms and hoses. But in between, the market was ours. The food the farmers left behind, peas and beans that fell from the trucks, tomatoes and squashes, pieces of meat and fish trimmed as waste. They lay on the sidewalk and in the gutters. They filled great cans that were supposed to be covered, but seldom were. There were always ten times more than we could eat, and there was never any need for fighting over it. Fighting? Quite the contrary. The marketplace was a perfect place for playing. And so we did, the young rats at least. As soon as we'd finished eating, there were empty boxes for hide-and-seek, there were walls to climb, tin cans to roll, and pieces of twine to tie and swing on. There were even, in the middle of the square, a fountain to swim in when the weather was hot. 
Then, at the first clang of the cleanup men in the distance, one of the older rats would sound a warning, and everyone would pick up as much food as we could to carry home. All of us kept a reserve supply, because some days, Sundays and holidays, the market would be closed, and we were never quite sure when this would happen. When I went to the market, it was usually with two companions, my older brother Gerald and a friend of ours named Jenner. These were my two closest friends. We liked the same, we liked the same games, the same jokes, the same topics of conversation, even the same kinds of food. I particularly admired Jenner, who was extremely quick and intelligent. One evening in early fall, Jenner and I set out for the marketplace. It must have been September, for the leaves were just turning yellow, and some children were throwing a football in a vacant lot. Gerald had to stay home that night. He had caught a cold, and since the air was chilly, my mother thought he would, should not go out. So Jenner and I went without him. I remember we promised to bring him back with some of his favorite food, beef liver, if we could find any. We took our usual route to the market, not long, not along the streets, but through the narrow walkways between the buildings, mostly commercial warehouses and garages that bordered the square. As we walked, we were joined by other rats. At the time of day, they converged on the marketplace from all directions. When we reached the square, I noticed that there was a white track of an odd square shape parked at the street bordering it, perhaps a block away. I say I noticed it. I did not pay particular attention to it, for trucks were common enough in that part of town. But if I had, I would have noticed that on each side of the, of the van were four small letters, N-I-M-H, is NIM. I would not have known that they were, of course, for that time, neither... I nor any of the other rats knew how to read. It was growing dark when we reached the market, but through the dusk we could see that there was an unusually large supply of food, a great mound of it, near the center of the square, away from the rooftop portion. I suppose that that should have been a warning, but it didn't. I remember Jenner saying, they must have had a really busy day, and we ran joyfully toward the pile along with several dozen other rats. Just as we reached the food, it happened. All around us, suddenly there was shouting, Bright, blinding searchlights flashed on, aimed at us and then at the mound of food, so that when we tried to run away from it, we could not see where we were going. Between and behind the lights, there were shadows moving swiftly, and as they came toward us, I could see that they were men, men in white uniforms carrying nets, round nets with long handles. Look out, cried Jenner. You're trying to catch us. They're trying to catch us. He darted in one direction. I in another, and I lost sight of him. We all ran straight toward the men with the nets. There was no other way. There's no other way to run. They had us all encircled. The nets flailed down, scooped, flailed again. I suppose some rats made it through, slipping between the men and past the lights. I felt a swish. A net just missed me. I turned and ran back toward the mound, thinking I might hide myself in it. But then came another swish, and that time I felt the enveloping fibers all over me. They entangled my legs, then my neck. I was lifted from the ground along with three other rats, and the net closed around us. Next chapter is called In the Cage.